Tonight, mounting deaths. India continues to see an increase in fatalities in the Kerala landslides with the rescue teams continuing to dig through the aftermath. Mass mourning. Hamas political leader Ismail Kenya reaches his final resting place in Qatar's tensions in the Middle East mountain. Historic swap. Three US citizens freed in a Russian West prisoner swap are back on American soil. Hopes of easing relations are high. Making merry, thousands flock to Russia's Kaluga for a night full of impressive and bizarre performances and installations. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining on World News Tonight. I'm Akwal Qureshi. Let's get you up to date on some key stories that developed now. Starting off with the updates on landslides in India. According to Kerala's health ministry, the death toll from the massive landslides in India's southern state of Kerala had risen to over 250, with another 220 persons still missing. Many of the roughly 250 residents in the area have likely been killed by the landslides, with several still missing. Government officials said that excavation equipment wasn't put in place until Wednesday due to the debris along the path and the bad weather. Rescuers are currently working to clear the rubble and searching for victims. Rescue dogs have also been deployed, but the chances of finding any survivors at this point are slim. Some local residents are still desperately searching for their missing friends and family members, while others are beginning to to flee the area. Officials are advising the best course of action now is for people to remain in the safety of the relief camps. Hamas political leader Ismail Henye will be buried today in Qatar, as his killing raises fears that Israel's war with the Palestinian militants group in Gaza could spiral into a fully-fledged Middle East conflict. On the tarmac of Doha airport, former Hamas chief Khalid Meshal, accompanied by other members of Hamas, received the coffin of Ismail Haniye. His body has been flown from Tehran after a public funeral ceremony was held for Haniye on Thursday. With prayers led by Iran's supreme leader Hamenei, the funeral drew huge crowds of mourners who had come to pay their respects. Hamas's political chief was killed early on Wednesday in an apparent Israeli strike as he visited Iran for the inauguration of new president Massoud Bezishkan. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the attack on Hanye, but Iran and other Hamas allies such as the Houthi rebels in Yemen have threatened to retaliate. The assassination came hours after an Israeli strike on Beirut killed one of militant group Hezbollah's top commanders. The back-to-back -back killings have prompted calls for revenge on Israel, raising fears of an escalation of a wider war in the region. Amid the rising concerns of tensions escalating in the Middle East from the recent series of Israeli assassinations in Buret and the Tehran, U.S. President Joe Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke by phone to discuss new military plans for protection against Israel. On Thursday, U.S. President Joe Biden spoke over the phone with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The White House said that President Biden reaffirmed his commitment to Israel's security against all threats from Iran, including its proxy terrorist groups Hamas, Hezbollah and the Houthis. The two leaders discussed efforts to protect Israel, including new defensive U.S. military deployments. Biden also stressed the need for de-escalation in the region. The call came urgently following the killing of senior Hezbollah commander Fuad Shukr in Beirut and the assassination of Hamas leader Ismail Haniya in the Iranian capital of Tehran earlier this week. Leading prayers at Haniya's funeral on Thursday, Iran's Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei vowed revenge. And the Iranian military also warned Israel of retaliation, saying Israel's war crimes have evoked wrath. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu maintains that Israel will not succumb to any attacks by its enemies, having warned on Wednesday that any attacks will be responded to forcefully. In a televised statement, the Israeli leader warned citizens that challenging days are ahead, adding that the Israeli military is prepared for any scenario and that it will exact a heavy price for any aggression against Israel. 
The New York Times revealed on Thursday how Haniya was killed during his visit to Tehran. Citing a number of Middle Eastern officials, the article said that an explosive device was covertly smuggled into a guest house in Tehran where Haniya was staying. The bomb had been hidden about two months prior and detonated remotely when the Hamas leader was visiting Iran for the inauguration of the new president. Iran's threats of harsh punishment for Israel and Israel's warning of a forceful response to retaliatory actions raised concerns of tensions escalating in the Middle East. As Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah says, the war in Gaza has now entered a new phase. Three U.S. citizens freed in Russian West Prisoner Swap are back on American soil after landing in Maryland. They were greeted by U.S. President Joe Biden and VP Kamala Harris and reunited with their families. Biden thanked his allies who he said made a thoughtful call to release the prisoners. A massive multinational prisoner swap on Thursday saw the release of two dozen people, including Americans held in Russian jails, in the largest such exchange since the Cold War. And now, their brutal ordeal is over, and they're free. U.S. President Joe Biden said the released include Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, Russian-American journalist Alsu Kurmasheva, and Vladimir Karamurza, a British-Russian activist. The deal that made this possible was a feat of diplomacy and friendship. The exchange was coordinated by Turkey, and this Russian government jet was seen at the airport in Ankara on Thursday. The White House said the U.S. had negotiated the complex trade with Russia and other countries. This deal would not have been made possible without our allies. Germany, Poland, Slovenia, Norway, and Turkey, they all stepped up, and they stood with us. They stood with us, and they made bold and brave decisions release prisoners being held in their countries who are justifiably being held. Eight prisoners held in the West were part of the swap. Germany confirmed they include Vadim Krasikov. Krasikov is a colonel in the Russian FSB Security Service who was serving a life sentence in Germany for murdering an exiled dissident in a Berlin park. Russian President Vladimir Putin had indicated he wanted him back. Germany's government said releasing Krasikov was not an easy decision. The Kremlin said the prisoners released by the swap were pardoned by Putin decrees and that the move was aimed at returning Russian captives held abroad. Venezuelan opposition's leader Maria Corina Machado called for Venezuelans to protest in the wake of the presidential election that incumbent Nicolas Maduro claimed to have won with 90% of the vote. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said there is an overwhelming evidence that the opposition's candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, came out ahead of Maduro. Venezuelans abroad on Thursday continued to rally over a disputed presidential election result in their home country, which has sparked deadly protests and a diplomatic fallout, with countries usually friendly to President Nicolas Maduro's now joining in calls for authorities to release detailed vote tallies and the U.S. announcing it would recognize the opposition candidate as the election winner. Venezuela's Electoral Council on Monday declared Maduro the winner of the July 28 election with 51 percent of the vote. But the country's opposition says their candidate, Edmundo González, received more than double the support of the incumbent president, according to the tallies they were able to access and have made public. The government has so far not shared any data beyond a national total of votes for each candidate, sparking accusations of fraud from the opposition. On Thursday, the presidents of Brazil, Mexico and Colombia agreed over a call to push Venezuela for transparency. In a joint statement, they said, quote, We call on the electoral authorities in Venezuela to move ahead quickly and let itemized ballot box level results be known publicly. They added they were willing to support efforts for dialogue and urged against any escalation of violence. Their statement comes as Venezuela's ties with other nations fray over election-related criticisms. Venezuela has expelled diplomats from at least seven countries. That includes Peru, whose embassy and consulate in Caracas were seen empty on Thursday. Lima has recognized González as the election winner and also ordered Venezuelan diplomats out of its country. After days of calling for Venezuela to come clean on the vote count, Washington said Thursday it rejected Maduro's claim to a third term as president. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in a statement, quote, Given the overwhelming evidence, it is clear to the United States, and most importantly, to the Venezuelan people, 
that Edmundo González Urrutia won the most votes in Venezuela's July 28 presidential election. The country's Supreme Court on Thursday accepted Maduro's request to verify the election results. The head of the Supreme Justice Tribunal told State TV presidential candidates will be presenting their vote tallies to the court on Friday. The country is bracing for more demonstrations, with opposition leader Maria Corina Machado calling for mass rallies on Saturday morning. In a video posted on social media, she said they were to back the more than 1,000 people who've been jailed for protesting, while urging her supporters to stay firm, organized and mobilized. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, forced to skim a year-long process into a couple of weeks, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has intensified her search for the best running mate to beat Republican presidential nominee and former President Donald Trump in November. A vice president looking for a vice president. Kamala Harris has a slew of choices, but the calculation on who'd be best is complex. There's the issue of swing states, which are essential in winning the Electoral College in November. Here, there are two main contenders from these purple states. There's Pennsylvania's governor, Josh Shapiro. A former litigator, he could help the ever-important Pennsylvania go blue. Outspoken about his Jewish faith and pro-Israel, this could be a hard sell for both protesters against the war in Gaza and for the Christian right. Then there's Mark Kelly. His biography fits the bill. A veteran and former astronaut, he's married to a victim of gun violence, former Representative Gabby Giffords. A senator from Arizona, he has experience on the border and on immigration issues. This could help Harris. But if chosen, Democrats would need to find a replacement candidate in Arizona in the next midterms. A very tricky state for Democrats to win. Another veteran is also being considered, former teacher and coach Governor Tim Walls. He's not from a swing state, Minnesota, but his Midwestern background could appeal to voters across the Midwest. Then there's another governor, Kentucky's Andy Bashir. Close to Harris for years, he's been pegged as an amiable attack dog for his successful quips against Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. His southern roots could also help, but making a dent in Trump's base in Kentucky may not be possible anyway. Finally, there's Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Skilled in interviews, he's highly popular among progressives. Many Democrats hope a Harris-Buttigieg pick would make double history as a first black woman and homosexual man on a ticket. But here, too, this could be a vulnerability when it comes to the conservative right. U.S. media has reported that two candidates, Gretchen Whitmer and Gavin Newsom, have ruled themselves out of the running. Generally, picking a VP takes months of careful consideration, for it's a role that can set the future of the party and the presidency for years. But here, Kamala Harris has had to whittle down that process into just a few weeks. Russia said that its forces had launched attacks on the Ukrainian air defense system while the Ukrainian side claimed its forces had taken control of the situation on the front line over the past 24 hours. The Russian Defense Ministry said in its daily report that Russian forces had hit three U.S. Patriot defense missile systems belonging to the Ukrainian army and one unmanned aerial vehicle control center. The Russian forces repelled Ukrainian attacks in multiple directions, launched offensives and destroyed many pieces of Ukrainian equipment, including tanks, armored vehicles and self-propelled artillery. The Russian air defense system also shot down 61 Ukrainian drones, missiles and U.S.-made HIMARS missiles. On the same day, the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine reported that Ukrainian forces had 76 combat engagements on the front line over the past 24 hours, with the most intense ones in Pokvorsk and Toretsk sectors in eastern Ukraine. 
And over in the Olympic Games, well, Algerian Imane Khalif's much-anticipated Paris Olympics women's welterweight fight against Angela Carini in a round of 16 lasted 46 seconds after the Italians stopped following a powerful punch to the nose. Carini fell to her knees, crying after Khalif was declared the winner. An Olympic controversy feared and foreseen. Punches as ferocious as the row. A bout that face calls to be blocked and in the end was abandoned after just 46 seconds. Italian Angela Carini could take no more, feeling unfairly overpowered by Iman Khalif. Why this attempt to offer consolation was rejected. The Algerian cleared to compete in Paris despite being disqualified from the World Championships last year after failing an unspecified gender eligibility test. Olympic organizers fear a witch hunt, insisting if it says female in your passport, you can compete as a woman. Complicating the issue is an IOC integrity dispute with world boxing's governing body. Clarity is needed according to the boss of athletics, which has guidelines dealing with high levels of testosterone. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney complained that Carini was not able to fight on an equal footing, but Algeria's Olympic Committee criticized malicious attacks on Khalif. It's complex for the sport and spectators. The IOC wants rules based on scientific evidence, but what makes a fair fight? And does a potential strength advantage outweigh the desire to be inclusive? UK Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer has hit out of what is called a gang of thugs who have clashed with police in several areas of the UK following the killing of three young girls in Southport. After meeting with senior police officers at Downing Street, the Prime Minister said a police unit would be set up to tackle similar outbreaks of violence. The violence in Southport took police by surprise. Social media rumours that the attacker was an asylum seeker mobilised the far right. The target, a mosque, and a night of violence followed. 150 miles north in Hartlepool, more of the same. Police said it was linked to what happened in Southport. And in London, groups clashed with police outside the gates of Downing Street. With the government and police under pressure to act, senior officers were called to meet the Prime Minister. Sir Keir Starmer said the violence was committed by a mindless minority, adding police would now work more closely together, sharing intelligence, tracking trouble across police force areas. But the details were scarce. There were no specifics on extra police officers or any talk of additional funding. In Southport, local police officers laid flowers near to the scene where the three little girls were killed earlier in the week but residents here are still angry at those who brought violence to this grieving community. The bricks and stones and debris from the flames were soon cleared up, but it has perhaps revealed a weakness in the way police prepare for and respond to violence, how hatred online turned to hatred on the streets and how quickly that was allowed to spread. Police used tear gas to disperse protesters in Nigeria, capital city Abuja, as thousands rallied against rising living costs and governance issues nationwide. Consumer inflation in Nigeria rose to a new 28-year high of 34.19% in annual terms in June. As well as soaring inflation, Nigerians are also grappling with widespread insecurity, which damaged the farming sector, while armed gangs kidnap residents and school children for ransom in the north. President Bola Tinubu has asked citizens to bear with his reforms and has vowed to pursue changes he says are needed to keep the country afloat. He signed a new minimum wage into law on Monday to help workers cope with hardship caused by his economic changes. But many of the country's 200 million people are either self-employed or do not have jobs. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News right after this. Welcome back. Thousands of people visited a small village in Russia, Kaluga region, to visit the annual Akolianin land after festival, famous for its impressive and bizarre performances and installations. 
This year's topic is, the, is pronounced us explored by the artists taking part in the festival. Burning some of the arts objects prepared for the festival in giant fires is one of its usual themes aimed to show the invasiveness of beauty and how quickly time passes. One of the highlights of the festival mostly attended by the young generation was a live performance of a joint team of elderly amateur singers of Kaluga region who were performing a famous Soviet children's song, Beautiful Fairway. Well, this is of course dedicated to the future and a way ahead. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again on Monday with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Sina Mai Dinne will join you next with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.